just have to say the same thing here, together with Dr. Gesa Lüdecke uh, running the um, Tuesday discussions. It's our second discussion in the semester. It's really exciting to have Dr. Susanne Unger with us today. Uh, Susanne uh, is both a media person <laughs> in, in many senses, a theorist, uh, somebody who works on film, uh, but also a radio journalist who has her own radio program and an environmentalist, and that's uh, what's so exciting. Um, Susanne was born somewhere here uh, in the area, uh, and she moved then to some other part of Germany, but uh, what really changed her life, I think, was when she uh, moved to um, Vermont for a uh, short time, for a year, as an exchange student or something like that, yeah. in high school, and after that she probably fell in love with America, that's what I guess, because she got all her degrees from America, her BA, her MA, her PhD from great university. When I say America, I mean the United States and Canada. Uh, she studied, she got degrees in psychology and in gender studies and in anthropology and in visual culture and in film studies. And her PhD was in film. Anthropology and film studies. <laughs> anthropology of film. Um, Susanne was spent a lot of time in America, actually until two years ago, for a very, very long time, working in publishing, working as an editor, but also working as a professor in some of the great universities like Duke and William and & Mary, and uh, for the longest time, I think, in the communication department of a university where I also uh, taught at American University in Washington, D.C. <coughs> and now she's here. She's working at the Technical University, not as a professor, but in media competency in that mm -hmm. field. Uh, she, I think when she came to Munich, she didn't know what she would be doing here. Uh, it was, uh, she just wanted to test, it, test the grounds and figure out what it's like to live in Germany after having lived in America for such a long time. So she had very little uh, to uh, idea of what was going to happen. And I don't know, you reinvented yourself by working for Laura, the local radio station in Munich, and working uh, in a field that you were always fascinated by. Uh, I, don't remember, you once told me the story about sheep that you carried, found yourself carrying across a river in Freiburg, and you were fascinated by sheep, and you wanted to write a book about sheep, and then you ended <laughs> up writing, doing a film about sheep, but you have been involved with animals as a, I could say, animal activist or con uh, nature uh, activist. Uh, even most recently, some of you were also involved in uh, helping toads cross highways uh, over the last few weeks. There's thousands of toads have been saved by volunteers like Susanne. Uh, and what I find so fascinating is, I mean, you found this, you, you identified this nature, or you found your own job uh, in, uh, in, in the radio station, uh, working for the Friends of the Earth Bavaria, which is the oldest German nature uh, organization, um, and doing a radio program for them. And I, I can't wait to hear from you, Susanne, about from somebody who is both a radio journalist and an environmentalist. So join me in welcoming Dr. Susanne Unger. Thank you. Thank you for this very kind and generous introduction. <laughs> I hope it won't disappoint you. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about my um, arrival in Germany and some of the things I've been doing since then, or also before. And there were actually a couple of connections. And I realized when preparing this talk <coughs> that about 10 years ago, I gave a conference on community radio <laughs> at a big conference in the United States and focused on community radio stations and environmental activism in northern Germany in Bremen at the time. So in a way, I'm coming full circle by sharing some of more of my work today and some of the work of Radio Lora. So, without further ado, this is a tenth title I've given this. Um, I will be in some ways continuing on some of the themes that Tobias Müller covered last week um, and hope that you know, I can also um, inspire a conversation about the connection between anthropology or social sciences and activism and medium activism. So this is some of the things I have in mind for today. I'll do a brief outline. I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between community media, which Radio Lora is one, We'll be using that as a case study and some of the um, roles that community radio can take on and can sort of, you know, carry for, for environmental activism. So some of the meanings that can um, emerge. Um, how am I doing volume wise? Does my, does my voice carry? OK, thank you. And then we'll have time for Q&A. So I already 
Christoph kindly already mentioned a few things about myself. Um, and yes, I did work on Shepherds. And actually, initially, when coming to Germany, expected that I would be um, working on a documentary film about Shepherds. But I arrived here just before the first lockdown. So I had to shelve some of my plans and instead turn to radio, because that's something that you can do even at great distance. So before we start, I wanted to just briefly talk about community radio in Germany, which is often talked about in Europe as community media, meaning that it's radio stations that are neither state-owned and state-sponsored, nor commercial or private radio stations. And if you're a radio listener, you might have come across some of that entire spectrum. How many of you listen to radio as a traditional medium, not as a podcast? Any radio listeners? Okay. Uh, German language radio, other stations? What are a couple of the stations that you listen to? Deutschlandfunk. Deutschlandfunk. Yes. Others? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. So you listen to foreign language stations? Uh, yeah. Okay, other stations. So it's a couple of you, I think you're listening to radio. Um, and you might have that sense, you know, if you look to Benedict Anderson, sort of part of that imagined community, that you're part of this community of listeners, even if you've never actually met the other listeners. Um, in our case, uh, in the case of Radio Lora, this is a radio station that's largely op operated by volunteers with a focus on community and local issues. And we can talk a bit more about some of those things later on if you're interested. But next I wanted to talk about the um, fact that actually community radio in West Germany, so I'm talking about pre-reunification Germany, um, emerged partly from the then very prominent environmental movement of the 1970s and 80s, and that it emerged in different parts of the country. Um, it was very closely linked to that movement. Um, it was also a time when several sort of pirate radio stations emerged, meaning radio stations that operated without a license. A very famous one is the Radio Dreiländer Act, Dreiländer Eck in the Alsace region, which you might be familiar with, um, or some of you might be familiar with, and that was a radio station that actually operated out of a van that would quickly, when you know the police were nearing, drive from Germany to Switzerland or to France, and so it's very mobile. That radio still exists to its present day. One of the things I've been fascinated with in my own study of radio is the fact that it's such an old medium in a way, but it continues to be relevant. And that's partly why I asked for a show of hands to see how many of you still engage with radio, not just in its form as a podcast. So there are several uh, community radio stations all over the country. There are actually only two in Bavaria. There are more in some of the other um, states in Germany. But they're part of a network. You can, if you belong to one station, um, receive training. You can participate in workshops. There used to be get-togethers of the non-virtual kind. But there's quite a strong network, and there are opportunities for people to be involved with other stations and you know, sort of discuss matters of local importance, talk about the mission statements, and so forth. I found that very interesting. Um, and I'm just sort of talking about the German-speaking ones, but I actually did some of my own training through a Swiss radio station. And it's very interesting to learn more about sort of Swiss politics and culture and the connections that radio producers and radio activists um, experience there. So our case study to have today will be Radio Lora 92.4 station in Munich, operating out of Munich. Mm -hmm. Radio Lora is about to turn 30 next year. And that means that some of the original contributors and founders are also nearing retirement age. So we have an aging population. But we also still have young people who are joining just out of high school or at university and so forth. Currently, we have about 100, 250 active contributors, meaning that these are people who produce content regularly. And we also have some shows that still continue that were founded in the early 1990s, for example, Radio Ufalos, which is a, a queer radio show. So you can, as you can see, it's sort of a pretty wide spectrum um, in terms of you know, demographics, in terms of age at least, <laughs> and linguistically as well. We, and I keep talking about we, so as a proper social scientist, I should perhaps distance myself from that station, but since I'm also a member of the station, so Radio Lora broadcasts shows Monday through Thursday, um, starting in the afternoon. 
that frequency is shared by a local church radio station. So if you listen to that frequency in the mornings or on weekends, you'll have a very different um, type of radio entertainment, um, just to, to let you know if you ever tune in at a different time. But Radio Laura um, broadcasts um, content in the afternoons and evenings. Typically, we have three hours of music or comedy, as well as five hours of non-music con contributions. And there could be features, political discussions, literature reviews, um, current events, all sorts of things. There's also a so-called magazine that um, broadcasts news that are of importance to the region or to Munich in the evenings. So sometimes there are also comments on international events, but the magazine is the um, sort of the heart of the, um, the program and that it's a show that airs daily. But there are also many other shows, such, like, such as the one that I'll be talking about, that um, are broadcast once a month, for example. Um, most of the content is produced, but there are also some live interviews. I just did my first live interview last week, and it was very exciting to be back at the station, um, you know, at a proper social distance. But what that also means is that it's not a radio where you have a lot of call-in shows where people would call in to debate a certain topic. It tends to be the show where you know, we share content that's been produced previously or you can listen to a live conversation, but it's not the kind of station where people would call in and you know, comment on something on air. We do have the so-called Gegensprechanlage, um, or literally it would be an intercom in English, but it's sort of a soapbox where people can leave messages um, and comments, you know, positive or negative, any kind of feedback on existing shows. And there's also a blog where people will engage in that. So there is some opportunity for people to um, you know, sort of engage in dialogue about the content. And of course, many of our listeners listen as a live stream. So they don't actually listen to it on the radio. And some of the features, uh, some of the pieces you can actually listen to um, after the fact, after it's been broadcast, or in the form of a podcast. So the Laura magazine you can listen to for up to a week after it's been aired. Uh, just some more general content. Um, we do have, as you can see, so there's animal welfare shows, there's a theater show, Friends of the Earth, or Bund Naturschutz, Parents for Future. So there are a number of groups, and people are always welcome to join and you know, create a new group or a new show. And one that's relatively recent that we just started this calendar year is a so-called series called Klima in Bewegung. Those are pre-produced contributions on the topic of climate change, uh, or rather climate change activism. So rather than just reporting on climate change as a fact um, or as an issue, this show actually focuses on the kinds of activism that people engage in in Munich and beyond. And there's sort of a reason for that. I'll we'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> Uh, the show that I'm involved with is called Phone Studio, so Phone Studio or Radio Rainbow, and I think that dates back to the earlier days of you know, Greenpeace and Rainbow Warriors and so forth. You can listen to it every third Thursday or as a podcast. Typically, we do two to three short interviews of eight to 12 minutes in length on a range of topics. And some of the more recent topics we've been covering deal with you know, urban gardening, um, unwelcome house guests, such as little pests, like all those you know, seen and unseen creatures that live with us, urban infrastructure and architecture, political decisions, um, you know, the International Automobile Exhibit, um, political parties. So we try to cover a range of topics. And here are a couple more. Sorry, um, these are a couple of shows that we've done in the past couple of weeks and months. I'll be actually doing one on Munich Central Park next Thursday, where we talk about um, a proposal, an alternative to the Stachos, which is a very heavily congested traffic area in Munich right now. But typically, these are some of the things that we've been covering in recent months. Our current team consists of just 11 members, and then women and two men. We also have occasional help from a Bund Naturschutz, a friend of the earth intern, so someone who's completing their Soziales Jahr for a year. They're always invited to um, produce content or do research on certain topics. Most of us are in our 
20s to 70s, most of us have full-time jobs in addition to working at the station for free. And something that I found very really interesting as part of this group is that our process is such that we meet once a month to discuss you know, possible topics for our next show. And it's been a very interesting and sometimes slow, but always consensus-based process. Um, so people will typically throw out a couple of ideas and say, you know, I've been interested in this topic and somebody else is more interested in something else altogether. But typically we somehow manage over the course of an hour or two to settle on an overall theme and then we try to have a couple of interviews that also relate to that theme. We have one person, Christina, who's the moderator, you can see her right there. Martin Henze, he's the, he works for Bund Naturschutz, he sort of has been hosting this show and has been guiding it, that's me at our recent show. Um, but typically we manage to sort of come together with a, a larger overall theme and then, oh, we hope at least, to uh, make all those different parts speak to that overall topic. And I think that in some ways that's made this show as strong as it has been and as long lasting because there's so many different um, people who participate. I mean, not so many in terms of numbers, but there's been room for everyone to sort of um, contribute their, their ideas and perspectives. And we also have a long backlist of topics that we'd like to cover in the future. Now I'm already nearing the end of my talk. Um, and I've tried to sort of keep it short so that we can um, you know, have enough time for questions and answers. But some of the things that I would like you to think about as you're thinking about radio today or in the future is also the role of the medium. Um, so as I said in the beginning, it's a relatively old medium. It's been around for a long time. People have always talked about how it might be replaced by television and how television might be replaced by the internet. But here we are in the age of podcasts and we still have people dialing into different stations or listening to radio shows at podcasts. Um, as a linguistic anthropologist, I would say that that also has something to do with our desire to listen to spoken word, to um, the things that we associate with being told stories. So if this you know, oral tradition of passing on knowledge, um, of not always just focusing on written language, but on also just sort of listening to someone tell a story. And as you all know, social movement st stories are often driven by personal stories. People might be inspired based on personal experience to become involved in a topic, or they might also be convinced to um, join a cause based on how a story is presented. And I'm so happy that the drawing that Tobias Müller made last week is still here. We probably won't have it on camera, but he talked about um, how you could try to get people who might not be as interested in the environment, like he talked about which group or which um, segment of the population you should aim for. He sort of said that you know, if you're trying to convince someone to um, join your cause or to become involved in environmental activism, for example, you should aim for those people who might already be somewhat interested but might not feel that it's their calling. And one of the ways in which you might be able to do that is by telling a story. It does not have to be through radio, but it could be done through radio, right? You could do it through film, through writing. You might have your own forms of expression, dance, poetry, whatever. But I think that's one of the strengths of radio is that you can bring together so many different voices from all over the world and have those people share their perspectives. And while those radio pieces are very ephemeral, they can also leave lasting traces, right? They can make the activists feel that what they've been doing has also created an impact. And so it's not just that moment of me carrying a little toad across the road and thinking, okay, so I've saved one, but it might be killed five minutes later, you know? Um, but it might make me feel like, okay, by sharing that story and by recording the voice of that toad or the voice of some of the other activists, I might be able to um, find others, or I might be able to interest others in that cause. Or I might make them think about some of the connections. One of the things that I personally like about podcasts is that you can share them <laughs> and you can listen to them again and again. And it might be a different experience every time you listen to them. Okay, so these are some of the things I was hoping to cover. Oh, one last thing I wanted to mention is that Laura, as a radio station, as a community station, is always interested in having new people produce content for them. There's no obligation, you do not you know, need to sign up for a lifetime commitment of producing content, but if any of you are interested, those of you who might not be interested in producing content in German, we do have a number of, number of foreign language shows. That list might be growing, I hope it will be, because you can see it's fairly Eurocentric so far. But 
those are opportunities to get involved. And for anyone who's interested in, you can always pitch some ideas to the editorial team and say, you know, I'd really like to do a feature on this topic. Or, you know, something that's really important in my home country has not really been covered by the German media. Maybe you'd like to rec report on that. And to some extent, the, I think Laura's already doing that. But there's always room for more and room for improvement. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to my experience with Radio Laura. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask those or to reach out to either Bund Naturschutz or Radio Laura directly. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.